Good evening. I'm Roger Harris. I'm, I was a big fan of the morning show, um, and now I'm a big fan of the morning mix. I've heard a lot about the contentiousness of KPFA, and I guess um, I'm hearing it, it, what it is like. Um, I, I had really more of a factual question to get, get it a little bit clearer in my mind. Um, shortly after the staff cuts were made, um, Larry Pensky, who I believe supports the recall, um, Larry was on the air at KPFA, and he said, yes, there were um, a severe financial situation at the station, and yes, um, cuts were necessary, but they cut the wrong people. Um, they, sh they shouldn't have cut the people that were cut, but they should have cut other others. Um, and now I'm hearing Brian say, I think I'm hearing Brian saying something different, that the cuts were not necessary, and that it, they could have been avoided. And um, that, that, that's probably a factual issue, and, and maybe we can get some clarity on that. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Who wants to answer that question? Like Brian. It was addressed to Brian. He should answer. Brian, do you want to answer that? Sure. Try to be quick. Everybody, calm down, please. And, and I apologize for uh, shouting out earlier. Um, I, I don't know what Larry said, nor can I be responsible for it. Um, he has always been a force unto himself. Uh, but but my contention is indeed that there were alternatives to these cuts. And I want to call your attention back to the fact that there was only one layoff that Pacifica made, that Pacifica imposed on KPFA. There's only one involuntary layoff that was imposed on KPFA, and that was Amy Allison. That is the only savings that can be attributed to Pacifica's actions. We are talking about one twenty-seven an hour per week employee at $20 an hour. So that's, when we talk about the difference between keeping the morning show and not keeping the morning show, that's the actual number that's in play. Not what it costs to run the morning show overall, because two-thirds of the staff we had left at that point are still working at the station. We're just working in other jobs. OK, can I, can I respond to a couple of things sure. that were said? Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, I appreciate the person who doesn't want us to talk about the morning show anymore and uh, to rehash that. But I want to tell you something that was very um, startling to me, and that was the response of listeners when the morning show was taken off the air. First of all, I think part of it was the way in which it happened, where it was suddenly abruptly over. There was no warning, there was no easing people into this idea, and there was no plan for replacing it. If you listened afterwards, you could tell there was no plan for replacing it. It just happened. And what happened was, that Save KPFA had just been given a slight majority, I agree with whoever said that, a very slight majority on the LSB, and we were contacted by our supporters and our friends who were enraged and who said they were going to stop giving money to KPFA. And we said... Great idea, by the way. I really said... fantastic idea. Well, I you know like... what? People give their money, their money speaks, and they want to have, they want to know that there's some response to it. And we said, don't do that. Don't stop giving your money to KPFA. Let KPFA know how you feel. And thousands of people responded to that. And I don't know, you know, how come that's so hard to understand. And the amazing thing is that to this very day, there are literally hundreds of people out there who are still upset about the morning show, who will call in when there's an open line and express their unhappiness about this, who will send emails. And it's, you know, I, I think that, like, there's sort of this, like, dismissive thing. But this was a show that had legs. And to talk about how much it cost without talking about how much money the show brought in is to really distort the facts. The fact of the matter is that the show raised more money than it costs to produce. And that means that programs that aren't able to raise as much money, who programs that ha can, can be on the air because the morning show was able to bring in that money. And that's a problem these days. The other thing I want to talk about is that sort of the, this idea that, that Henry just dismissed 
about what we refer to as the misappropriation of the email list. KBFA has an email policy. It has a policy about using its email and what it's to be used for and who decides. That was violated, and that's not a small matter. And the fact of the matter is that KPFA could have sent out those emails. It didn't, someone didn't have to go to an outside outfit to do it. And it certainly is true that it didn't have to pretend it was coming from KPFA when it was not coming from KPFA. There were many aspects to the misappropriation of the email list. It also meant that the emails of KPFA listeners, emails which we had promised people would be held confidential, were in the hands of other people. And in the hands of someone who is, who is on one side of a very powerful factional split on the board. If it had been one, someone on our side who had had it, you know you would have heard about it. Okay, so it's just, and you know, if Tracy's going to speak again, I'm going to have a fit because the problem is that this is not a, a discussion. This is not a debate. It's, I didn't attack her. I said what happened. Calm down, calm down. I, I'm not going to speak to the email issue. I said a little about it before. Tracy wants to respond later on. That's her business. Um, I want to talk about the layoffs which, again, Tracy did not do. Um, but I happen to agree that the layoffs weren't done very well. They were not, they weren't done very abruptly. There wasn't enough communication. There was no communication with the board. There was very, no communication with listeners. I don't know how much, but not enough with the union. There were a lot of problems about it. Some things could, perhaps could have been worked out in terms of people cutting hours, more, you know, cutting hours and reducing pay for other people to save those jobs, or I don't know what. But, but I know why they happened that way. They happened that way because the station had, over the, since every, basically ever since I got in office, but I'm not going to take responsibility, <laughs> the, the station's income has been going down steadily. And management, with the support of the majority of the paid staff and the, and the, the group that Margie represents, it, um, had refused to take any meaningful action to address that problem. Uh, Aki Tanaka was here tonight, made this very nice chart, some of you may have seen it. The uh, top curve represents listener support, the second one represents salaries and benefits. You'll see, and the top of the peak is 2005. Okay, you see what happened after that, in the years between 2005 and 2010, we had this dr dramatic drop, 28% in listener support, and salaries and benefits were rose and then leveled off but never went down. There was no money. The state the station had to borrow money from the Texas station, which only had a very little bit, to meet its payroll in September of 2010. That's why the layoffs had to be done abruptly. Cape local management had refused to do anything. The existence of the whole foundation was at stake because the Pacifica Foundation is all one legal financial entity. The foundation as a whole is responsible for the debts of each of its components. If KBFA's creditors had called in their debts at that point, the whole foundation, all five stations, and, and all the services we provide to affiliates and everything else we do would have gone under. So Arlene Engelhardt, as the executive director, who's really not a, you know, not some kind of a devil woman, she's a very nice person, older than I am, you know, good-hearted, you know, you can agree or disagree with her judgments about this or that, but she had a fiduciary responsibility to save the damn foundation before it went down the tubes. And she stepped in and said to KPFA, you have to make cuts, you have to bring your payroll down to the $1.75 million, the same level uh, proportionately as the others that the other stations had already achieved. That meant, it, because it hadn't been, you know, if I fault her for anything, it's for not doing it earlier. If, she, if it had been done earlier, could have been done in a better way. But at that point, it had to be done abruptly. There was no alternative. It's not a question of prudence, or it's not a question of responsibility. It was a question of there was no money to keep paying all those people. Okay. Uh, my name is Adrian Lobby. I'm a member of the unpaid staff. I help produce Pushing Limits, which is KPFA's disability policy. <coughs> And I might know some of you, or you might know some of me, because I was involved in the 1999, um, say, Pacifica uh, 
struggle and I raised money here in, in Marin County. We came down and did a, a phone bank, which I believe saved the network. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud of what we instituted when we did take back that board, which was our bylaws and our democratic structure. So when I look at this whole piece, it's through that lens. And I said, back then when I was coming down here over and over again, it's like, oh, why did this happen? Why am I doing this? What, what's going on here? I kept thinking, there's not enough people involved in KPFA. There's the staff who work hard and are, have to be concerned about their jobs. They don't have time and, and perspective enough to see what's happening on the national board. And so there was a cascade of decisions on the national level that threatened and ended up in the KPFA lockout. So I thought, OK. And I didn't get this idea. Other people came up with it. Let's have this triumvirate where we're going to have managers who are know what they're doing, can read a balance sheet and so on. We're going to have listeners who just care deeply and have all these skills and talents in their back pockets. And we're going to have staff. And we're going to make a nice little community where everybody's represented and everybody can work together and we can save it and make it great. And... That's, I want to echo Brian. What's good for our station? What will take us forward? Since I've come, I've been there eight years now. I'm one of the very few lucky people who got to be on the air after that. I have seen people who will not work together. And I don't see anybody going away. You know, I mean, individuals, of course, we burn them out. But as far as, far as factions go, we don't go away. There's people who say we want more community, we want more unpaid staff, there's people who say we want to be more professional, we want to be, um, get our shops down really good and, and learn how to do this just right and have a lot of, and, and it's a shift of station resources, how much resources are going to the unpaid staff, how much resources are going to the paid staff and their production facilities and so on. We fight about this stuff. And then we fight about the program. If you take off my program, damn it, I will call everybody who has been on the air in my whole time I've been on there and tell them to write someone and tell them this is for crap. Because my program is the damn best program on the air. And I, I think pretty much all of us feel that way. And what's required from staff is that when your program gets cut, you say thank you for the however many years and however much time I've been on the air. Thank you for the privilege of uh, this 50,000 watt station and to be able to be the gatekeeper to say who gets to be on it and who, how to frame that discussion. And you say, how can I help? You don't go on the air and say, this is wrong. And you definitely never use the airwaves to do that. If this had happened at any other station, what happened with the morning show, those people would have been fired on their ass in a hot second. It's just completely yeah. not allowed to abuse the listeners and take their trusted voices and say, my program is the best. Whether it raises the most money, whether it is the best, that's unethical. It does not surprise me that we have people who are still angry about it because they were whipped up. And the propaganda that goes out week after week about this is just wrong, and I got the stop thing. I want to make uh, I want to make two points if I can. Um, the, our, when Arlene Ringelhart stepped in, she offered people voluntary severance policies. That came from her. There's been this frame tonight, and I've seen it out of where Pacifica is the enemy. Pacifica is not the enemy. Pacifica is doing as best it can with five stations and all these problems inside of all these stations, and attacks from the right, especially in some of these areas, to keep the whole thing afloat. And we are, do not have them. Believe me, if I thought Pacifica was the problem, I would be the first to come up here and tell you that. And uh, thank you all, and thank you, Barbara. Emily. My name's David Quinley, I'm a member of the MPJC. Um, I still, I, I like to hear the arguments of why you need a special election, especially when you are 
talking about not having that much money. Um, why well, just can't go through a regular election? Um, uh, I haven't really been convinced that. Could you speak into the mic? I haven't really been convinced of the need for not. Why well, just can't wait for a regular election? You know, uh, um, I've been a political activist all my life, and I generally like to um, deal with um, my adversaries politically, not administratively. Um, that's my personal history, and I enjoy a, an argument um, as much as the next person, and I um, have sort of a, you know, like win some, lose some attitude toward um, these kinds of things. Um, that's the way life is. I, I was very, I was very reluctant to support the recall, but I was convinced finally that it was, uh, that it needed to happen of, around this thing that <laughs> people here seem to be very dismissive of, and that's the, the, the issue of the, the email list. Um, we still don't know. We, we have never been told exactly what happened, but um, the results were very clear to me. The effects were very clear to me, and it was very disturbing. Um, I think that you know, democracy is complicated and messy, but one of the things about democratic process is that if someone gets elected, then they can get unelected, um, and uh, that those rights have to be there, and um, this is a procedure which exists. Um, Tracy was elected at the same time I was. We will both, um, if we full up, serve out our full terms, we will both be on uh, the KPFA LSB till the end of 2013. Um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, that, that the issue of uh, making a change now is important and critical. Um, and that, uh, that I, I have to respond to something that Henry said, I'll be really quick. The fact of the matter is that if this election had happened when it was supposed to have happened, the person who would have replaced Tracy on the board is Janet Coburn, who is an ally of hers. And um, you know, to 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 talk about um, as if those of us who support the recall were looking for um, a particular person uh, to come onto the LSB to support us in any particular way is ridiculous. Um, what we were after and what we are after is removing Tracy. And we take our chances with whoever will come onto the board, um, the local board, to replace her. P and B seats, not the uh, LSB. Well, that's right. The P and B seats a different question. I think I think it's an interesting question as to why we don't wait till. I think it's an interesting question as to why we don't wait until we have elections. When the people who put the bylaws together first met, those of us, David Green, some people remember, but other folks who got together, decided that if there is going to be a recall, the whole board should be recalled because this is a proportional <laughs> representation bylaws. And that's not a joke. That's not a joke to say the entire board should be recalled because if what happens is if you have a majority that starts picking off people, you no longer have proportional representation. Why do we have proportional representation? Why do we have that? We have it so that different ideas, that when an organization starts becoming bankrupt, that you have different ideas that are floated in and out, so that people can get some sense of the differences between the, 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 the groups, and also, it helps everybody, because when people start arguing these things out in a civilized way, you finally end up with a solution which is better than any solution that any faction will come up with. That's why we have proportional representation. We've had it from the beginning. Now, there are some problems that we've also come up with in terms of proportional representation, and we'll talk about those problems, but certainly, uh, it is better than any other thing that we can have. And, and this type of recall is a simply a way 
of eliminating proportional representation. It is not democratic. It is not democratic at all. Uh, among other things, people should be aware that if you are, in fact, recalled, you can't run for the board for three years. <coughs> that itself is unfair. Um, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll stop there. No, yes, if anybody else wants to talk, who hasn't, they should. I would. Yeah, at the end. I didn't really get to write it down. I hope I can say it right. Terrace. Oh, sorry. I didn't yell either. Um, there's the idea of gatekeepers. Your name? Oh, Valerie Hood. Um, there's this whole idea of gatekeepers, and I, I think that's maybe one of the biggest pieces that I see here, is we're really talking about gatekeeping tonight. And... Um, one of the problems, I, you know, I listened, I grew up with Chris Welch, and I loved her so much on the morning show, and I understand that feeling of, of loss, I, I felt that, but I never felt like she was a gatekeeper. I always felt like there was a diversity of, 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 of opinions and ideas, and, you know, we heard all kinds of radical ideas, some I agreed with, some I didn't, but something changed when this latest morning show happened. All of a sudden, it felt like gatekeeping to me. And I would go in and I would phone bank, and I would say, hey, how come we can't talk about certain topics in the morning when, when that's, that's the big audience that, that we have? And I feel like so many of the things I'd like to hear about um, are, are, are just never talked about. Um, and I just don't understand it. I know I, I email in, I call in, I've asked. I, I know a lot of other people have too. And when I phone bank, people go, why don't you talk about, well, you know, they'd ask me, why don't you talk about these certain subjects? And I go, I don't know, so I asked. I said, how come? And I was basically told, when hell freezes over, by one of the staff. And I thought, wow, that's an intense response, you know? Like, who gave you God? And, you know, who told you, who, 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 who gave you the right to say, what is free speech radio? And I felt like we had lost it. And the one thing I think is, yeah, it's true that five mornings of the week, maybe it's not always like the best show. But on the other hand, we're now hearing a diversity of topics that we've been missing for a really long time. I just think the whole gatekeeping thing here is what's most essential. And I, and I know that that's the, we, we, we have to look to the board to solve this problem. And I thank you for, for looking at it. Thank you. My name is April Hurley, and I'm glad to follow that comment exactly, because I was so frustrated during the Bush years watching this radio go down. I stopped listening. In fact, in Santa Rosa, I can't listen unless I go online, and now I pick the shows I listen to, and one of them is not the old morning show. The morning show was a gatekeeper. And a lot of the shows are still gatekeeping. We have music shows where nobody can say what they're thinking about the, what the atrocity was that happened that day. They play the music as if nothing happened. And that's the way the news is. It's as if nothing happened. Nobody's feeling any emotion. Nobody's outraged. Yeah. And this tool, this radio station, is community radio. There should be so much grassroots organizing going on through that radio station. There has been gatekeeping. And I've gone to the local station boards, and I've seen who's been calling the Roberts rules every second so that the, the, list, the local station board doesn't function all that time during Bush years. And all I can say is I can't stand it anymore. And of course there's going to be factions. And I'll tell you why. Because this station is to be on message with the Democratic Party or or whoever. But it's it's the one percent or close to it. Or NPR or corporate public radio or whatever. It's it's crap. And all I can say is I still pick and choose and it's 
It's a total loss. And this local station board that I used to go to the meetings, I don't go anymore, I used to go and I used to watch the dysfunction being engineered into the meeting. I could not believe it. And the reason was is because they didn't want, certain people didn't want <laughs> democracy now during drive time when we could have pulled in so many premiums that way. They didn't want it. And that's what happened when the morning show was changed this time. And I was, I was impressed. I'm Brenda Thompson, and uh, I've been listening to Kathy on Facebook. Closer to the mic? Oh, I've been listening to Kathy on Facebook for a long time, and I don't remember details, so I don't know all the new shit that's being discussed. I did listen to the radio station when they were discussing the cuts before they actually happened, and I was extremely disappointed because it sounded very corporate in pattern to me. I work for United Airlines and I'm for 40 some odd years, so the hierarchy is very ingrained in me and I know what, when that happens, when you start from the bottom to cut, if you have, if you have a certain amount of money that needs to be, that has been cut out of the budget, and you start from the bottom, from the people who have the less amount, then you're going to get the people at the bottom fighting over the crumbs. And that's what I hear tonight. And when they were discussing uh, the set, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the lady's name, and I think she was from Pacific, but uh, they brought up her salary, how much she was making. And her response was, well, that would be how much I would be making if I was working someplace else, which very much sounded like the senators who gave themselves a raise when it was back in the 80s, when we first started, when the economy first started going down. And they upped their salaries $20,000. And it has been 30, 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> So the pattern that's happening here is what I saw, is that you start from the bottom and start, if, instead of equalizing the cuts so that everybody is sharing in the depression that we're having, to me it makes it more unified and it keeps this from happening so much. Thanks. <laughs> we came down to the two of them. I'm sure Tracy wants the last word. Duke it out. It's okay, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless you really want to go first. I'll stand between them. No, 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 no. I was going to go with the order we were in. But. That's fine. Okay. Um, in response to the person who just spoke, and I appreciate hearing what you say because when you've been enmeshed in this for a decade, as I have, you really need sometimes for people to come up and say, this is what it sounds like if you don't know anything about this. <laughs> so let me say one thing, absolutely. Um, the top and the bottom in Pacifica, the top makes twice what the bottom makes. It's the starting salary, full time, Right in at the bottom is around forty to forty. I think it's forty-two thousand dollars if you work full time. Um, the executive director makes around eighty-five or ninety. It's two to one. Corporate America four hundred to one. Last time I checked. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, Margie and I didn't actually come onto the LSB at the same time. I came on in two thousand and seven. Um, I was reelected to my second term in twenty ten. Came in second out of twenty. 70 people or so. Um, for the first three years of my term, I suspect none of you had any clue that I was on the LSB. You heard nothing. Um, that's because the fact of me being on the LSB does not in and of itself send Pacifica into chaos or KPFA into chaos. So that is something to remember. Um, many things happened in 2010. They didn't all happen because of me. Um, Another thing that I think is important to say is many of you got a postcard in the mail. I'm guessing a red, shiny postcard at the end of December. 
I read that postcard because I got one too. They sent one to me. And it said, get rid of me because I'm supporting Pacifica and they can't get rid of the executive director if they don't get rid of me first or something like that. And just for the record, uh, the Pacifica National Board did retain the executive director through the end of the year. So you may get rid of me if you wish, but it's not going to get rid of the executive director, for better or for worse. And secondly, usually you recall people because of things they did not because of things that other people did. And I do support the executive director, but she doesn't exist or not exist in that job because of me. Um, it is true that one person ended up being formally laid off by Pacifica. That's because nine people took a severance package, and it was good of the ED to offer a severance package. It's actually a pretty generous package, and we might have been positive this year if the severance package hadn't been as generous as it was. But nine people took advantage of it. That's good labor practices, not bad labor practices. And that's because we had to remove $375,000 from the payroll if we were going to have a chance in heck to break even. Um, it would have been nice if we could have reduced that from our telephone bill, our website bill, our humongous travel budget. But frankly, none of those things add up to $375,000 or anything close. At the time of the layoffs, KBFA's payroll was two-thirds of all the money coming through the door. There wasn't anything else to cut. And the entire morning show production of $200,000, that wasn't even enough. If the voluntary severances had not happened, approximately 10 to 12 people would have been laid off. And we went to arbitration in the Amy Allison matter, and the CWA's own arbitrator concluded that the layoffs were caused by financial necessity. It was not inappropriate. She was not entitled to back pay. Uh, there have been five complaints filed at the National Labor Relations Board. They have all been dismissed, including the one that said that the layoffs were out of compliance with the contract. They were not. The NLRB knows what they're talking about on this subject. Finally, I guess I have to talk about the email list a bit because it keeps coming up, so I will. Um, The folks at the Morning Mix had a problem. I mean, they came in because basically um, the CWA staff said, none of us are going to replace Brian and Amy. We're going to show solidarity with them, and we're all on strike, basically, and none of us will take this, take this position. That's since broken down, and several have, but at that time, that's what people said. So um, some of the unpaid staff said, well, we'll put in a proposal to do something, at least temporarily, and they did. The problem is that people ran around saying that it should be boycotted, and they were a bunch of scabs, which of course is not true because if you're not paid salary, you are not, by nature, a scab. Um, but that said, you know, don't, don't appear on the show, boycott it, et cetera, et cetera. This wasn't good for KPFA. We were in this mess. The morning show wasn't there because we were having financial problems. Having more financial problems wasn't going to solve anything. So they felt like they wanted to talk to the listeners and say, hey, you know, give us a try. We understand that, that you might be upset, but here's what we're trying to do. Um, they didn't have any money being unpaid staff and all that, so they looked into MailChimp and a couple of other services, and they couldn't afford them because of the size of, of the list. They asked me as a board member if I might be able to send out this announcement, and I said, okay. Um, and I did it twice. And then I stopped because everybody started screaming at me. Um, if I had wanted to send you all emails after that, I could have done that, obviously. Um, I didn't send you emails on my behalf. I didn't send you emails on the behalf of my nonprofit. None of them. You didn't get them. I didn't send you emails on behalf of the Independence for Community Radio Faction. Well, I think a couple of you have gotten emails from, say, KPFA, like every week for, for a year and a half. So what is this abuse of the email list? If I wanted to abuse the email list, I would have abused the email list in my own factional political interests, whatever they are. What I did was send an email to help KPFA at a time when it was struggling. It was from KPFA because it wasn't about credit for me. It asked people to donate to KPFA and to listen to KPFA. That's what board members are supposed to do. So this business about the email list is crazy, and it's not the only crazy thing going on here. So folks, no, the recall doesn't make any sense. Not because I'm desperate to be on the KPFA and the Pacific <laughs> Board, but because it doesn't make any sense. And at the end of my term in 2013, I, I will retire. 
no problem. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I do want to say about the email list is when we have a published policy that says how you treat your emails and how you keep them confidential and how they don't leave KPFA servers or go to outside people, and you violate it, any person's email who has left your possession can sue you. Unless I apologize for shouting out, maybe you can control yourself. What, what Larry did, he did before we had a published email policy at KPFA. No, that's not true. No, that's not true. Okay, okay. okay. I, I may be wrong. Yes, you are. And Larry was suspended from the airwaves for four months. Um, no. No. This is actually incorrect. I hope it's not coming off my time. Don't lie. I'll take it off this time. All right, everybody. All right. All right. Um, I, I heard a couple things I want to correct. One was that uh, Arlene Engelhardt was somehow the benevolent mastermind behind our having a voluntary severance package at KPFA. Uh, I think we all agree it's a good thing um, that a large number of people left of their own accord and saved the station a lot of money, and there were no arbitrations or grievances resulting from that. Um, however, uh, this was something our union in negotiations asked our local management to put on the table. Uh, that they agreed to on their own initiative, <coughs> and in fact, that Pacifica tried to renege on the terms of after the fact. They tried to change the amount of pay that was owed to workers, and you can talk to any one of them. In fact, I understand Tracy had to advocate for one of them herself to get the uh, severance she had initially been promised. It, it still underlines the fact that when the morning show got axed, there was only one part-time job in play. The second was I was very surprised to hear Tracy say that Amy Allison and I had the lowest seniority uh, of any host at KPFA, because it's actually just an out-and-out lie. I mean, Tracy knows better than that. Um, I've been at KPFA for eight years. I have more seniority than Mitch Jezerich. I have more seniority than John Hamilton. Uh, when my case was pushed to arbitration, Pacifica had to concede it. They had to reinstate me with back pay because they didn't have a leg to stand on procedurally for why they asked me. And the reason I think this is important uh, is because Pacifica's justification for axing this show and Tracy's justification for axing this show has been a moving target. First it was, we have to cut you because the union contract doesn't leave us any other choice. Well, the union contract forced them to reinstate me. Then it was, well, you raise so much money because you're in a great time slot, anyone else would raise that much money. And when 8 a.m. turned into one of the worst hours of the day for KPFA, when overall morning fundraising dropped by more than 50%, that argument disappeared. They haven't repeated it for several months. And the argument we're hearing now, and it's very twisted and contorted, is that there's a $550,000 deficit in KPFA's budget, and we somehow fixed it by cutting one 27-hour-a-week employee. No. 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 We didn't hear that. <clears throat> In fact, well, let me, let me just wrap up. Um, and, and this thing about CWA is an arbitrator. Like, CWA doesn't get to pick the arbitrator. The arbitrator has to be mutually agreeable. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Our station, our network, is in a very precarious place. Our unions found out that the money that Pacific is supposed to be putting into our retirement accounts, money we voluntarily withhold from our own paychecks, is being diverted. Pacific is using it for other purposes. We informed them about this in September. They said they'd fix it. They started doing it again last month. We started to have paychecks bounce for the first time in the network last month. We're terrified because we haven't gotten any communication from Pacifica about why this is happening or what they're doing about it. And the point I want to raise 
is that this is terrible management. This is a terrible management regime. I am not saying you have to put the morning show back on the air to fix KPFA's problems, but you have to put something on the air that works. And a leadership that does not address the fact that they've had a 50% plunge in fundraising during morning drive time, the most important part of the day, that they have had to increase the amount of time we spend in fundraising 30% in the course of one year and are on track to do it more in the coming year. This is a leadership, this is a regime that will sink the station. There's a basic question of accountability here. And if you don't think the station or the network are being steered in a good direction, then there is a tool for dealing that more frequently than once every three years. And it's the recall. And I think it's an important tool to take up in this situation. Thank you. I'm beginning to hear things over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that you want to keep squabbling about it. It's tiresome as hell. So, uh, oh, a new face. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, hi everyone, and thanks for coming out this evening. Um, I'm Anthony Fest. I do the news on Sunday, every other Sunday. I've been doing that since uh, 1995. Um, I've also been involved with the Morning Mix, and proud to be involved with the Morning Mix. I think it's uh, far and away the most diverse program we've had in the morning. Um, a couple of preliminaries before I talk about the recall. Um, when you hear about uh, the staff or the staff union, or, or severance packages, or uh, wage rates. Remember that you're only talking about a, a small portion of the staff that are in the union. Uh, you know, I think it's under 30 now. There are 200 odd unpaid staff. Also, there are people who are paid uh, part-time. If they're under 20 hours a week, they're not in the union. They're mostly paid the union rate, but they don't have a, a role in, uh, in bargaining for that rate. So the vast majority of us are, are unpaid, some are paid by the hour, and, and some have the um, full union representation and benefits. The vast majority are unpaid. We do radio for the sake of doing radio, because we care about it. Um, as to the, the bylaws, the matter of the um, eligibility, if you hold a public office of some kind, let me read it word for word. A delegate shall be deemed to have resigned the position of delegate if she or he becomes a candidate for public office or accepts a political appointment during his or her term as a delegate. And the sole exclusion is uh, civil service jobs. You know, I used to be a state employee, so that was relevant to me. But uh, I'm not a lawyer, but that, that political appointment, that sounds like what Dan Siegel had with, with uh, Mayor Kwan. Uh, now to the recall. I've been on the program council. I've been on the local station board as a staff representative for five years. I've sat in meetings with Tracy <laughs> many, many hours. And uh, not that I haven't uh, disagreed with her at times, but I can say that um, she is the most intelligent, hardest working member of the local station board. And to kick her off the board would, would be a detriment, a, a setback uh, to KPFA, and uh, frankly, a travesty. Um, so I, if I'm not making myself clear, I'm urging you to vote no, and I'm <laughs> urging you to urge everyone else you know that is a, a KPFA subscriber to vote no. And there's, there's another matter here, um, and it's actually, um, uh, and, and Harry alluded to it a moment ago, that which is bigger than, than one individual. If she is off the uh, local, or the, the national board, then the local station board will elect a replacement. The, so-called Save KPFA faction already holds three of the four seats. If uh, Tracy is off, they will presumably have another election and they will uh, fill it with one of their own, if, if history is any guide. They have 50, uh, 14 out of 24 seats is 58%. They have 58% of the seats on the local board. They already have 75% of the seats, KPFA's four seats on the national board. If they take that other one, then all of you who espoused or, or, or were voted for the uh, Independence for Community Radio philosophy will now have no voice on the national board. If you <coughs> voted for Henry or, or Aki or, or any of the other ICR candidates, there will now be no one on the national board who represents your views. And uh, you can 
you can see that, right, in their, their little leaflet here. What happens when we win a replacement to, the local board will pick a replacement to serve out the rest of Rosenberg's term on the Pacifica National Board. This may be enough to tip the balance of power on the National Board. So this is really just a, a plain and, and simple uh, power grab. They're not satisfied with three out of four. They want four out of four. They want the whole thing. It's not the least bit democratic, and uh, it scares me. It should scare you. Please vote no. Thanks. Well, we usually um, end at 9.30. Hurry up, clock. Get over there. And so <laughs> we're about ready to go, I think. And I really want to thank everybody, but uh, this has worn me down. I, I, you know, I'm just so impressed with everybody's intelligence, and I just can't figure out why y'all can't listen to one another. And 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 you know, you it, you've got so much talent, and and it uh, seems like um, uh, there should be an alternative to recall, and there should be some mechanism to make you work together better. Wasn't that? Well, let's talk about it.